work is substantially enlarged. Now, you speak of work freely undertaken as hobby, but I don't believe that. I think work freely undertaken can be useful, meaningful work done well. Also, you pose a dilemma, which many people pose, between the desire for satisfaction in work and the desire uh, to create things of value to the community. But it's not so obvious that that's a, a dilemma, that that's a contradiction. It's by no means clear, in fact, I think it's false, that contributing to the enhancement of pleasure and satisfaction in work is inversely proportional to contributing to the Maybe value of that inversely proportional, mm -hmm. but it might be unrelated. I mean, take some very simple thing, like selling ice creams on the beach on a mm -hmm. public holiday. Um, it's, a, it's a service to society. Undoubtedly, people want the ice creams. They feel hot. Uh, on the other hand, it's hard to see in what sense there is a, either a craftsman's joy or a great sense of social uh, uh, virtue or nobility in performing that task. Why would well, anyone I must say, perform seen, that task if they were not rewarded for I've it? I've seen some very cheery-looking ice cream vendors sure, who happen to like the idea. A lot of money. That, and they happen to like the idea that they're giving children ice cream, which seems to me a perfectly reasonable way to spend one's time as compared with uh, thousands of other occupations that I can imagine. Recall that a person has an occupation, and uh, it seems to me that most of the occupations that exist, especially the ones that involve what are called service, that is, relations to human beings, have an intrinsic satisfaction and reward associated with them, namely in the dealings with the human beings that are involved. That's true of teaching, and it's true of ice cream vending. I agree that ice cream vending doesn't require the uh, commitment of intelligence that teaching does, and maybe for that reason it will be a less desired occupation. But if so, it will have to be shared. However, what I'm saying is that we, our characteristic assumption that pleasure in work, pride in work, is either unrelated to or negatively related to the value of the output, that's an assumption which is related to, to a particular s stage of social history, namely capitalism, in which human beings are tools of production. It is by no means necessarily true. For example, you know, if you, if you, if you look at interviews with workers on assembly lines, for example, that have been done over and over again by people who do industrial psychology, you find that one of the things they complain about over and over again is the fact that their work simply can't be well done the fact that the assembly line goes through so fast that they cannot do their work properly. Their pride in craftsmanship is itself to mean it. Let, let me just mention another. Well, I, I just happened to look recently at a uh, study of uh, longevity in some journal of gerontology. Don't ask me why I was reading that. And uh, it uh, tried to trace the factors that you could use to predict longevity, length of life. And, uh, you know, cigarette smoking, drinking, uh, genetic factors, everything was looked at. It turned out that the factor that was the highest predictor, the most successful predictor, was job satisfaction. Now, people who have nice jobs live long. People who are satisfied with their jobs. Now, what leads to job satisfaction? So, and I think that makes a good deal of sense, you know, because that's where you spend your life and that's where your creative activities are. Now, what leads to job satisfaction? Well, I think many things lead to it. And the knowledge that you're doing something useful to the community is an important part of that, which many people feel. I mean, many people feel and uh, uh, many people who are satisfied with their work are people who feel that what they're doing is important to do. They can be teachers, they can be doctors, they can be scientists, they can be craftsmen, they can be farmers. I mean, I think the feeling that what you're doing is important, is worth doing, you know, contributes to those with whom you have social bonds. That's a very significant factor in, in one's personal satisfaction. And over and above that, there's the pride in, uh, and the, and the self-fulfillment that comes from a job well done, from simply taking your skills and putting them to use. And I don't see any reason why that should be, uh, why that should in any way harm. In fact, I should think that that would enhance the value of what's produced. But let's imagine still that at some level it does harm it. Well, okay, at that point, the society, the community, has to decide how to make compromises. Each individual is both a producer and a consumer, after all. And that means that each individual has to join in those socially determined compromises, if in fact there are compromises. And again, I feel that the nature of the compromise is much exaggerated because of the distorting prism of uh, a really coercive uh, and self and personally destructive system right. in which you we You say live. the community has to make decisions about compromises, and um, of course, communist theory provides for this in its whole thinking about national planning, decisions about uh, investment, directions of investment, and uh, so forth. In an anarchist society, uh, it would seem that, that you, you're not willing to provide for that amount of uh, governmental superstructure that would be necessary to uh, make the plans, make the investment decisions, to decide these kind of uh, compromises into, between uh, whether you give priority to what people want to consume or whether you give priority to the work people want to do. I don't agree with that. I mean, it seems to me that 
anarchist or, for that matter, left Marxist mm -hmm. structures mm -hmm. based on systems of workers' councils and federation provide exactly the set of levels of decision-making at which decisions can be made about a national plan. Similarly, state socialist societies also provide a level of decision-making, let's say the nation, at which national plans can be produced. There's no difference in that respect. The difference has to do with the, uh, with the participation in those decisions and control over those decisions. The anarchist and left Marxist views, views like the workers' councils theory of, say, the council communists who were Marxists, left Marxists, in their views, those decisions are made by the informed working class through uh, their assemblies and their direct representatives who live among them and work among them. In the state socialist systems, the national plan is made by a, by a, federal, by a national bureaucracy uh, which accumulates to itself all relevant information, uh, makes decisions, offers them to the public, and occasionally, every few years, puts itself, uh, uh, comes before the public and says, you can pick me or you can pick him, but we're all part of this uh, remote bureaucracy. These are the, ext these are the uh, poles, these are the polar opposites within the, so within the so socialist tradition. In fact, tradition. there's a very yeah. considerable role for the state and possibly even for Not civil for servants for bureaucracy, but it's the control over it that's different. Well, see, I don't, as I say, I don't really believe that we need a separate bureaucracy to carry out uh, governmental decisions. You need various forms of expertise. Ah, oh, yeah, but expert, see, expertise is very much, let's take expertise with regard to economic planning. Okay, there's certainly in any complex industrial society, there should be a group of technicians whose task is to produce plans uh, and to uh, lay out the consequences of decisions, to show and explain uh, to people who have to make the decisions that if you decide this, you're going to likely get this consequence, because that's what our linear programming model shows and so on. But the point is that those planning systems are themselves, well, they're industries, and they are simply part of the, they will have their workers' councils, and they will be part of the whole council system, and one, and, and the distinction is that these planning systems do not make decisions. They produce plans in exactly the same way as automakers produce autos. The plans are then available for the, for the workers' councils and uh, council assemblies the same way that autos are available to ride in. Now, of course, what this does require is an informed and educated working class, but that's precisely what we are capable of achieving in advanced industrial societies. Well, this is really basically the last question, which is, how far does the success of uh, libertarian socialism or anarchism as a way of life really depend on a fundamental change in the nature uh, of man, both in his motivation, his altruism, and also in his knowledge and sophistication? I think it not only depends on it, but in fact the whole purpose of libertarian socialism is that it will contribute to it. Uh, it will contribute to a spiritual transformation, precisely that kind of great transformation in uh, in the way humans conceive of themselves and their uh, ability to act, to decide, to create, to produce, to inquire, precisely that spiritual transformation that uh, social thinkers from the left Marxist tradition, from Lex Luxembourg, say, on over through anarcho-syndicalists have always emphasized. So on the one hand, it requires that spiritual transformation. On the other hand, the, its purpose is to create institutions which will contribute to that transformation in the nature of work, the nature of creative activity, simply in social bonds among people. And through this interaction of creating institutions which permit new aspects of human nature to flourish, and then uh, the building of still further libertarian institutions to which these liberated human beings can contribute, this is the evolution of socialism, as, as I understand it. And very finally, Professor Chomsky, what do you think of the chances of... Uh societies along these lines coming into being in the major industrial countries of the West, as we refer to them, in the next quarter of a century or so? I don't think I'm wise enough uh, or informed enough to make predictions, and I think the predictions probably reflect personality more than judgment, generally, about such poorly understood matters. But I think this much, at least, we can say. Uh, there are obvious tendencies in industrial capitalism towards concentration of power uh, in narrow economic empires and in what is increasingly becoming a totalitarian state. These are tendencies that have been going on for a long time, and I don't see anything uh, stopping them, really. I think those tendencies will continue. They're part of the stagnation and decline of capitalist institutions. Now, it seems to me that that development towards 
state totalitarianism and towards economic concentration, and of course they're linked, uh, will continually lead to uh, revulsion, uh, to efforts at personal liberation, and to organizational efforts at social liberation. And they'll take all sorts of forms. I mean, throughout all of Europe, in fact, there are, in one form or another, there is a call for what's sometimes called worker participation or co-determination or even sometimes worker control. Now, most of these efforts are minimal. Uh, I think that they're misleading and, in fact, may even undermine efforts for the working class to liberate itself. But in part, they resp- they're responsive to an in- a strong intuition and understanding that coercion and oppression, whether by private economic power or by the state bureaucracy, is by no means a necessary feature of human life. And the more those concentrations of power and authority continue, the more we will see revulsion against them and efforts to organize to overthrow them. Sooner or later, they'll succeed, I hope. So it's going to be a time of turmoil.